Thank you, Catherine. I want to thank the folks here at SMU who have put this on. Catherine, working diligently day and night for many months. Catherine Maurer as well. I'm not sure where she is right now, but she deserves a big thanks. And then Laren O'Neill for her efforts. Um, you know, a lot of this happens in a way that I don't even see, and, and it's uh, just turn it over to them, and it's a miracle. That's all I know, is that it works when I let other people do it and don't try to step in. All right, today I'm going to do something different. I am not going to give you my traditional 50 slide speech. I only have a few minutes, and what I want to say really can't be said as well with slides as it can with words. Uh, today, I want to talk about where America is in history. And I'll be focusing on this slide right here. Where America is in history with the choice that's coming up at the polls. But I don't want to talk about people or parties because this is really not the choice that America is facing. This is not a contest between Obama and Romney. This is a contest between two completely different ideologies. One which leads to decline and poverty, as you see on the left there, and the other which leads to prosperity and wealth. Make no mistake, this is America's choice between socialism and capitalism, a choice that will reveal who we've become. It's hard to believe that we're facing that choice right here in our homeland. I'm so glad that my father, who fought for America flying his B-29 over Tokyo, is not alive to see what's become of the nation he defended and what 405,399 Americans died for. Well, we won that battle only to find then ourselves in a 40-year Cold War. And growing up, I vividly remember at my dad's instruction building a bomb shelter under the house so that we might survive the nuclear onslaught of the evil socialist empire who sought to destroy us. The United Soviet Socialist Republic was our clear enemy and American capitalism the system which lifted our living standards so far above theirs was America's greatest ally in vanquishing the evil enemy that socialism clearly was. Yes, we won that battle too. But today, I bet you, if you ask an American public school student what USSR or CCCP stand for, they won't be able to tell you. Just 20 or so short years, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union, we find our own population marching headlong into socialism at a pace that even former Soviets find astounding. The U.S. descendancy into socialism is happening with breathtaking speed. Who says that? Pravda. Having traveled down socialism's entire path from its early stage seduction to its late stage serfdom, Surely the Soviet press knows the truth about the sheeple that socialism turns us into, right? Of course. Even Vladimir Putin, at his talk in Davos, warned, that the, warned the U.S. not to head down the path of socialism. In a strange but revealing twist of irony, here's the leader of Russia warning us to stay off of socialism's path because of where it leads. Clearly that's not some ivory tower intellectual's fantasy view of socialism, uh, as you might find in a university, uh, so you would think we'd listen up. Yet, did you see these warnings for us displayed, brought to us boldly in American newspapers? No. Why? Could it be that America is already so far down this path that the media is now a propaganda tool for the left, telling you exactly what suits the left's purpose and hiding the truth? Of course that's what it is. We spent last night discussing that with Bill O'Neill, publisher of Investors Business Daily. Indeed, emboldened by the media today, socialists have recently come out of the closet here in our homeland and are now wearing their ideology on their sleeve, proudly touting the socialist utopia, even with the slogan forward, by the way, is a slogan that's been used by Mao, Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler. Um, the socialist utopia and awfully condemning capitalism as a system based on greed, blah, 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 you've, you've heard it. Marx would have been proud of them. Given that this battle is now so open, I'd like to go further here and set out precisely what it's about. The stakes, you might call it. American-style socialism is different from that of the Soviet Union, but there are many paths to socialism, such as with the socialist democratic states of Europe or Venezuela. Ultimately, though, they all lead to the same place, the squashing of individuals under the feet 
of the much larger government entity. This is a painting by a Russian painter named Boris Kustodiev, um, which <coughs> depicts what it feels like to the Soviet people, the system after a while. So let me take a few moments to delineate for you the two choices that we have, these two choices in America's epical battle. This is a choice between individual freedom and the tyranny of the majority, as Thomas Jefferson called it, between a single person's rights and the might of the state, between whether we are the government's people or they are the people's government, beholden to us. Who's on top is what we're defining. This is a contest between whether big government constantly interjects itself to solve our problems or whether we tell government to get out of the way and let us solve our own. This is a contest between a system which destroys incentives by taxing success and one which leaves incentives naturally whole as when what's mine stays mine. This is a choice between redistribution and production, between whether we spend our time and energy making a bigger pie for all to enjoy or a smaller one which leaves us all equally hungry. It's a contest between those who seek to live at the expense of others, the 47% and more, and those who seek to keep the fruits of their own labor. This is a choice at the personal level between dependence, at the personal level between dependence or responsibility, between addiction to the public trough or self-reliance and personal discipline. It's a fight about whether equality or opportunity should be our goal. The first of these, equality, is a childish fantasy that never has and never will be achieved. The, the second, opportunity, is what everyone seeks in reality, even in the most oppressive totalitarian states. This is a struggle between whether we regard good choices, where, I'm sorry, whether we reward good choices or bad ones. If you think about it, there are literally thousands of choices we make in our lives from the time we first realize we have the ability to influence our destiny. People who make repeated good choices tend to succeed and they often become relatively wealthy. Those who make repeated bad ones fail and either change their ways or continue in decline. Indeed, pain is a great motivator for change if we allow it. Today, we're increasingly punishing those who make good choices and rewarding those who make bad ones. It's no wonder that we're so far off track with the poverty rate now being higher than when LBJ started the war on poverty in the late 1960s. Far from helping staunch poverty, government assistance has now crippled whole generations and ingrained poverty in society's fabric. This also then is a choice between whether we celebrate wealth or denigrate it, whether we thank society's rich or scorn them. It's a contest about who's the hero in America, the for-profit businessmen and women, who bring us all the products we love and the jobs we need, or the self-appointed do-gooders who condemn profits under the elitist banner of altruism. This is a contest really between morality and the glorification of the state. Let me show you some pictures that I took in the Soviet Union, pictures of mine when shepherded there by a Soviet friend of mine, Alexander. I met Alexander in the Soviet Union as a part of a trip with the Inst Hoover Institution in 1991. He had been a spy for the Soviet Union. He came, he came to Georgia and was a professor at the university in the philosophy department. His job was to find all the dirt he could on America for use in the Soviet propaganda machine, crime, prostitution, drug, ad drug addiction, inflation, unemployment. Send it all back home so they can say how bad America is every night on the news. Well, he fell in love with America, turned counter-spy for the United States, and when I met him was part of the underground movement to help destroy the system there. And so we all met, we were helping push, continue to push them over the edge toward the end. And uh, he taught me many things, and I could go into a lot of them, but um, one day I said, Alexander, I got about a, a little time left here. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to a Soviet farm because I've heard you're so unproductive. He said, you don't have time for that. I, I said, what are we going to do that? And he said, come with me, from his little cramped apartment, 10, 30 feet by 30 feet, three generations living there. Come with me. So he took me downstairs, passed all the locks on his door, out to a graveyard. And we started to walk through the graveyard. At the beginning of the graveyard, you see the graves from 1800s, right? Uh, you know, this is, the so this is the Soviet nation before... Uh, communism and there's some semblance of God in this here's some you know there's Christianity 
um, you, 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 at least they were celebrating some being higher than them in the state. That's before 1913. But as you keep walking down the graveyard, the time progresses and you get up to a, a, around 1913 and the graves get shuffled to the back and all of a sudden this is the kind of thing you start seeing in a Soviet graveyard. He didn't say anything to me. For obvious reasons. This should give you the creeps. This is the state glorifying itself, glorifying all the great Russian statesmen and, and politicians and uh, philosophers like Marx and people who supposedly gave their life to the state and then they become like deity, the ones that we worship. So in conclusion, this is not just some normal election year contest between two people or parties. The question we're facing is what America has become and whether we'll turn further down a path from which history suggests people cannot escape until they reach its only possible end, which is poverty, bondage, and oppression, serfdom, as F.A. Hayek called it. Something in me tells me, and many of you too, I know, that this may be America's last chance to turn bright for a distance of nearly a hundred years for the journey of at least four generations. People ask me all the time, is America past the tipping point? I used to feel like we could shuck off the Soviet seduction, but sadly, just two weeks ago, when looking out at my money and capital market students, I just all of a sudden saw them, not 20 years old, but 60, sitting at a table in a small cramped kitchen, poor, with nothing but a bottle of vodka and a haggard face, debating American history and wondering, where do we go wrong? Just like I saw people doing in the Soviet Union in 1991.